Uh, can you all see my screen now? We can. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So um, this is the second live session. And let me see if I can get my... This is, okay. <laughs> oh, there we go. For some reason it wouldn't progress. Um, so this is what I thought we'd cover today. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I probably you've, you've, you know, done some valuation uh, type stuff with Phil Towns course, uh, I'm guessing, but there are people in the course and so this may be more for the benefit of those who are watching the recording um, who don't have much experience or not Phil Towns students. And so have been asking, you know, is there, uh, can, we, can we talk about maybe fundamental analysis and you know, valuation a bit. Um, so I thought we'd talk about that for a bit. Uh, we'll talk about kind of just a basic, simple business to kind of help us understand uh, how you go about valuing a business and kind of the moving parts there. Uh, and then we'll kind of go over to back of the envelope uh, valuation methods. Now, personally, this is kind of what I do initially when looking at a stock. It's not typically the end result or the the uh, final, you know, valuation that I do. Um, there's other more, a little bit more complicated, but not too complicated um, methods out there. And there's also some tools that can help you and some paid services as well that I, I subscribe to that can also help with that. Just it's more about data aggregation more than anything. Um, and then we, we could potentially, you know, if one of you wanted to pose a stock that you're looking at, maybe we just um, kind of go through it uh, with some of these shorthand back of the envelope valuation methods and see if we can come up with value. Uh, and then it, I thought we'd go over some technical analysis. Um, so some, some things that I like to look at, uh, in my opinion, and in my experience, prices uh, kind of move more on technical analysis in the short term than fundamental analysis. So then the underlying fundamentals don't matter as much in the short run, in, in my experience. Um, but in the long run, the fundamentals do matter. And so uh, I, I kind of look at both, right? Um, <clears throat> kind of for the short term. How do you define short? Yeah, so I would say anywhere from, you know, days to two, three months. I think technical analysis is probably, probably overrides fundamental analysis. Um, but anywhere, you know, from like three months to years, um, maybe six months to years, Fundamental analysis, I think, is the, the main driver of where prices are going to go for a stock. Uh, but good question. Um, and then I thought we would just go over, I know uh, Arlene was interested in maybe learning about a few different option strategies. And I think in this course, these will be the three primary strategies that we talk about. Uh, we can also talk about uh, kind of what what you learn in Phil Town's course. It sounds like with selling cash secured puts, right, to kind of mm -hmm. decrease the basis of the stock that you ultimately want to own. Um, so we, we can also talk about that. That that's not a too hard of a, a strategy to understand and uh, grasp but so so I think in in future sessions we can also go over that um, so let's let's just kind of recap maybe first though what we talked about last time so kind of the key points there were uh, how options are priced and you know the price according to the black Scholes model or some variant of it and these models have kind of some underlying assumptions that are that, that seem flawed in, in my opinion. So uh, they're assuming that the current price, whatever the price is now or today, is um, the accurate, you know, value or the accurate accurate price for the stock. And um, 
that the stock is equally likely uh, to go up or down from here, right? And so you, you can see this, um, this graph here. So if, to, if this is today, um, then can you see my, my drawing, by the way? Yes. Okay, I just got this, this new tool and so I'm trying it out. Um, so from this point, you know, we're, we're, we're you know, basically 50% likely to go up or 50% likely to go down. And you can see this kind of sideways cone. Um, that's the model, you know, giving you like one standard deviation um, within this cone. Uh, your price will be within that one standard deviation move, uh, right? Which one standard deviation and uh, is is about sixty eight percent likelihood. So in between here and here, you know, prices will fall between these two lines um, sixty eight percent of the time. That that's kind of like how the math is working on the pricing of these options. And so they're saying most of the time you're gonna the, the model's assuming you're gonna fall within this range, and the cone gets wider, so the range gets wider, the further out. So these are days, right? So the, the further out you go, because there's more more time, more room um, for the stock to move up or down, so the the cone is wider. Uh, so you can, and we don't, at least I don't believe that this is how. Um, the real world works and you know if a stock is a good it's a good company and uh just like in in march right like march 23rd at the low did we really believe that stocks were just as likely to go down um you know facebook for example when it was hitting its lows around that time do we do we really believe that it's as likely to go down another 50 points as it is to go up another 50 points from that, you know, very low valuation. I, I don't think so. And I think it's, you got mar market psychology and structural elements of the market that caused prices to go down that far. And so that's, those are, those are times when you would want to take advantage of the mispricing, right? And so you can buy options that are assuming the stock's not going to go up 50 points because maybe that's that's way out here um, in this model, and so it's saying, you know, maybe that's like a a four sigma event, right? That 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 price would get back up fifty points within the next few months, uh, but it happened because um, you know we just had a temporary blip, and uh, prices kind of reverted back to probably where they should be valuation wise, right? So um, we won't go, so this is kind of what I described, right? Um, it assumes that things are normally, prices are normally distributed from the current today's price. So like I just said, so that's why we want to buy, we, you know, we want to take advantage of these, these flawed assumptions and we want to buy options Basically, when they're cheap, when, when the when the market is assuming there's not a high likelihood of it achieving a certain price, um, we want to buy those call options, for instance, right? And w likewise, when the market is is saying that you know there's a very li high likelihood that it could go lower and achieve this lower price then that's maybe what you want to sell a put option because the market's going to be pricing those expensively. So we want to sell when things are expensive. So maybe we sell a put, we buy a call, right? The, the cheap call, sell the expensive put, things like that so that we can tilt the odds in our favor. And again, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to stop me at any time. Um, <clears throat> so, so we talked about you know, we want to buy long option positions, like a, a long call position, when uh, the stock is trading far less than fair value, and the stock is maybe near some technical support levels. So we look at the technicals kind of for the short term, um, 
determination of kind of where the price might go. Um, and then we want to buy a short position when the stock is trading far more than fair value. So if it's, you know, very expensive um, with the idea of, of that reversion back to the mean and when the stock is near some technical resistance levels. So, so that's why, you know, I want to talk about fundamentals, which is the valuation part and technicals, which is kind of the, you know, where's support maybe and where's resistance for this stock. So I've got this example and this example has, have any of you read the um, Joel Greenblatt's book? So Joel Greenblatt's kind of a, a well-known um, legendary investor. Uh, well, maybe he's not as, he's not as well-known as Warren Buffett, but he's, he's, uh, he, he's uh, in, in the investing universe. He's kind of one of the rock stars because I think he compounded like at 50% a year, close to 50% a year for about 12 years, if I'm remembering correctly, um, before he kind of just stopped uh, running his, his uh, hedge fund. Um, but he wrote a book, he's written several books. He wrote a book called The Little Book That Beats the Market. And it was followed up by a sequel called The Little Book That Still Beats the Market. Um, so the, it's a nice short read. If you haven't read it, uh, I'd encourage you to read it. But at the beginning of uh, one of these books, he gives this example. And so we're going to go through this example. And I think it's, a, it's one of the great examples to teach valuation to someone who's coming into it new and fresh and who hasn't really maybe thought about valuation much. So uh, let's just go through this example that he gives, and then I'll ask you guys some questions because we're, we're going to try and value um, Jason's business, the sixth grader. So Jason's a sixth grader, and he buys, you know, those 25-cent packs of, of gum that uh, have five sticks of gum in it, right? And he sells those sticks of gum at school for 25 cents each. So he buys it for 25 cents. He sells the, the, the pack for $1.25, right? 25 cents times five pieces. So he makes $1.25 in revenue from each pack, a dollar in profit from each pack, right? Um, and then Jason, let's say he sells four packs per day at school uh, and to his fellow classmates. And that nets him a profit of $4 a day right? So, um, you know, we can, we can determine uh, with some assumptions how much profit Jason will make uh, before he graduates high school. So if he, he does, he, if he makes uh, or sells four packs a day, four dollars of profit a day, five days a week, there's about 36 weeks in each school year. And we said he's in sixth grade, so um, he's still got, let's say he's towards the end of his sixth grade year. So he's got six more years of school left, at least in, in, the, in the United States. I don't know how it works in Canada or, or elsewhere, but you know, we have um, 12 years of kind of primary education. So uh, when you're 18, you typically graduate and then go on to college after that. So he's got six more years left in the school system. So that, if you do the math, um, he could make a profit of $4,320 over those six years, right? So um, the question is, how much, uh, oops, how much would you be willing to pay for 50% of his business? Do any of you have an opinion? Salim, do you have an opinion? <laughs> uh, no, I'm not there's, no, there's no wrong answer. I just think about my Phil Town stuff, and he was saying that um, publicly traded companies are typically selling for what, eight times 
their value. And so a private company, you'd want 16 times value if you're buying it out. So, um, so it would be taking 16 times, you know, 50% of that number. So, you know, 21. Yeah. So if you bought, yeah, I guess if you, so you're saying if you bought uh 50% of the business, you get, you'd be entitled to half of these profits. So about 2000, let's say $2,160. Right. Right. Of profits you'd be entitled to over these six years. So if you are buying half the business from Jason, would you today hand him $2,160, I guess? No. The question is, would he take it? Yeah, I mean, would that be fair to you to to pay him half of what he's he's expecting to earn over the next six years? Let's no, say. So. so so yeah, that's there's the two thousand one hundred sixty dollars, right? So is that is that? Well, you got to kind of think about. Well, you're not going to get your two thousand one hundred sixty dollars back if you pay him that much for six years right so that might seem a little bit pricey right you're you're gonna part with your two grand now and you're not gonna see it it's gonna trickle in over the next six years so you've got that opportunity cost right well you could have just taken that two thousand dollars and put it in an index fund and gotten the you know the, the, the average rate of the market for six years and grown your $2,000, right? So there's time value associated with money. And so uh, receiving $2,000 six years from now shouldn't be worth uh, as much as $2,000 today. It should be worth less, right? Because of that, that uh, opportunity cost element. So maybe what about 1500, right? So you pay him $1,500 today. And if all goes well, you get back $2,160 over six years. I mean, that's certainly better than, than the first scenario, right? Um, you can see how you'll generate more than your $1,500 over six years if everything goes according to plan. We'll net a profit of about six hundred um, twenty dollars. Is that what I said? So maybe fifteen hundred dollars would be good. Well, but you've got to think about. You know, we're just assuming that it's almost a guarantee that he's going to generate those profits, those anticipated profits, right? And there's all sorts of risks out there that could prevent these profits from coming to fruition, right? So maybe maybe the school uh, starts clamping down on kids selling things at school, right? The, the principal says, hauls Jason into the, to the office and says, no more selling gum. If I catch you again, you're going to be expelled, right? And suddenly the business is over. Maybe that happens in seventh grade, right? So you got maybe one year of profits and uh, now the business is close kind of that regulatory risk right or um you know they, they they could um just kids could change their their habits and they no longer want gum they, there's some other uh candy that kids are interested in nobody wants to chew gum anymore right so there's just different someone risks. starts under, undercutting him yeah there's competition right so somebody comes in because he's got a fat profit margin right he's selling each piece that costs him five cents for 25 cents so he's marking it up 500 percent, right so what if somebody comes in and starts selling pieces for 10 cents right it's not like he's got an exclusive supplier so you know other kids could go to the store and and get gum so when, when they see him making those fat profits yeah, they may want to get in on some of that action, right? So yeah, per, very good point. So uh, now that we've explained some of that, like what what would you maybe, and this is, there's no right answer for this. It's just kind of like if you were making Jason an offer for 50% of his business and kind of considering some of the risks, what might you offer him? 
I mean, some people may not be interested at all. Like, ah, I'm not, I don't want to give you any money for, for half the profits. Over the $135. $135. Okay. Right. And there's probably justification for that number somewhere. Right. I mean, in, in your mind, it's like, all right, I'll take a flyer for $135, but I have the potential to make, you know, 2160 over the next six years. So 135 to 2000 plus, that's pretty good return if it all works out, right? Maybe it's something less than that, um, but you're comfortable at $135 that you'll maybe get your money back and, and maybe some what of a return, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, you know, if I said $1, right, probably all of you would jump on that, right? I mean, I would, I would take that chance. I was like, all right, Jason, I'll give you a dollar for half your business. So, so I think, you know, we probably can all agree that the value of his business is somewhere between $1 and $1,500, right? Um, that somewhere in there. So valuation is tricky because it's, 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 it's a range usually. Um, it's not usually a finite number because there's so many factors that can affect uh, a stock's or a company's value, right? Because we don't know we don't know the future with, with certainty, right? Um, so you've got company specific risks, you've got risks to the industry, you've got risks from competition coming in and maybe uh, destroying your profit margins. You've got uh, You've got non kind of company specific risks, right? So you've got that opportunity cost. So if suddenly interest rates go up, so the risk free rate, so that maybe the, the, the rate that you get from just investing in treasury bonds, maybe that jumps up to 10%, right? And so now suddenly you're like, my opportunity cost just went up because I could just take this money that I was going to use to buy Jason's business and put it into something that's super safe and get a 10% return. So that means uh, I need to get a, a, an even higher return from investing in Jason's business. Maybe I wanna demand 30% a year, right? Because there's all those risks associated with that um, to kind of compensate for the fact that I can get 10% risk-free. But if the interest, if interest rates are low, like they are now, and my opportunity cost is like, you know, sub 1% or something, right, over the next six years, then maybe Jason's business looks more attractive and I'm willing to maybe pay up for uh, a return from Jason's business that's maybe only 10% or something like that. So, um, you know, I, I, I think that's a good example and it, and it's good to kind of think about it in simple terms, you know, like a a simple gum business like that or a lemonade stand. Um, but th but this is what good investors do: they try to estimate the intrinsic value of a business, and then buy it for much less. Uh, but because fair value is typically a range and not a finite number, you need to have kind of a comfortable buffer because so many of your assumptions could turn out to be incorrect. So this is a quote from Warren Buffett. He says, intrinsic value can be defined simply. It is the discounted value of the cash that could be taken out of the business during its remaining life. And so, you know, in this statement, we can pull out a few different elements. So he talks about it being the discounted value uh, of the cash, right? So uh, that, that kind of speaks to the opportunity cost element where we have to take the expected cash flows over, you know, maybe the next 10 years and we have to um, discount them back to present value. So, so we, we essentially need to account for um, what we could get on our money, the return we could get on our money um, if we don't make this investment, right? So if it's either sitting in a bank or if we put it in an index fund, 
Um, and so typically the discount rate that is used by um, kind of financial professionals in valuation models, I would say is probably anywhere from 7% to 12% most of the time. That's probably what you would see, right? So people are assuming, uh, another, another word for discount rate is required rate of return. Those are the same thing. If somebody says, what's, what's the required rate of return? Same thing as discount rate. So um, seven to 12%, that's typically what most investors uh, require to invest in stocks. They want to get at least that return per year over time, right? And if you look at the, the stock market, that's kind of the range where uh, over you know long periods of time, you do get anywhere from seven to 12% rate of return on your money, right? And so you need to find, it's, for a stock to be undervalued, it needs to provide you a return that's greater than that that um, seven to twelve percent rate, um, and and at the end of the day, it's it's the it's the cash that that we care about, right? It's the cash that can be taken out of the business. So, and and we can get into that probably a little bit more in in future sessions, but. Um, what we're typically looking at is free cash flow. Kind of a proxy for free cash flow is earnings, kind of the net earnings um, or earnings per share, right? Earnings per share is the same thing as net earnings. It's just on a per share basis, right? Uh, so for each share, how much did the company earn? And uh, we, we need to think about what's the remaining life. In that Jason uh, example, you know, we, we assume that the remaining life of the business was six years because that's when he graduates and he's not gonna continue running his gum business in college, I guess. Um, so some businesses might have a finite life. Uh, I think most businesses in the kind of uh, publicly traded businesses, um, we assume that their, their remaining life is infinite, but sometimes that assumption is probably not warranted, um, right? When you had uh, um, Sears, Sears Holdings, right? That stock uh, or JCPenney, um, I think several years ago, we all knew that, that those were not infinite life businesses and that they were probably going to come to an end probably sooner than later. So that has to factor into your uh, valuation. So um, while we're talking about, and, and I'm sure you've talked about this in Phil Town's course, right? Because it's one of the four M's is the moat. Um, and, you know, valuation is tied uh, kind of inextricably to a company's economic moat. And what we mean by moat is what durable competitive advantages does it have um, against competition? Because like Salim pointed out, competition is probably the biggest risk for most companies. And the the kind of biggest factor that can derail um, the future of your company's profits, right? Um, because when competition comes in, there's a price war. Price war means margins get smaller, profit margins get smaller, and therefore profits and earnings and free cash flow um, all decline. And uh, theoretically, can go to zero you know, your profits can go to zero. And if, if that happens, then your business isn't worth, worth much. So ideally, we want to we wanna invest in businesses that have some sort of moat around it, some sort of uh, feature that protects it from competition. 
And here are a few. There's actually a great book. Um, now I'm, I'm totally going to space the guy's name. Um, It'll come to me maybe maybe later, but there's a really good book. I, I think it's 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 uh, there's the little book series that you know that starts with the little book. I think it's the little book of moats or something. No, I don't know what it is. Um, but it it's uh, the guy who kind of was the main analyst at Morningstar, who uh, I can't believe I'm spacing his name, who wrote this book, and he kind of goes it through each of these types of economic moats in detail and provides examples of companies that have these moats. So I'll put that, I'll put a link to that book in the discord group. Um, maybe we'll start a channel for, for kind of good books. Cause there's, there's a lot of good books out there. Some of them are not as well known as others. And a lot of them are kind of quick, easy, simple reads. And you, you gain a lot of knowledge just, you know, over a, few hours reading reading the book um, but he talks about these different moats um, we don't have to go through them in detail today but I, I'm sure some of you have you guys talked about this in the uh, Phil town course yeah yeah we, we just got past moat the other well, this is my class just got past moat the other week yeah okay so probably some of these are familiar to you you know um, some of the obvious ones are like uh, intangible assets, right? So if you've got uh, like Coke, the, the Coke brand, right? It's um, something that Coke has built over many years and with billions of dollars of advertising, right? To kind of get the mind share and uh, everyone has this great feeling about Coke, right? And uh, so when you think about a nice cold drink, you think about Coke products because they've kind of ingrained that in, for generations <laughs> into our culture, right? Um, <clears throat> so there's certain brands like that that uh, that do have some protection value, and so if somebody was going to compete with Coke, it would be hard because uh, people are just used to buying that brand of soda. Um, patents is is another big one. If you're a pharmaceutical company and you develop a, a new drug for some sort of condition or disease, then the government basically gives you a monopoly to sell that drug for a period of time. And, um, and then, you know, you, you, you rake in fat profits and, and big profit margins during that time. Um, switching costs, for example, if you're some sort of software company, uh, for example, salesforce.com. So Salesforce has some software that's used by most large companies uh, that for uh, customer relationship management, right? So salespeople use it, organizations use it, and they're branching out to, to other areas of the enterprise. But once you have input all this data into that software system and you've been using it for several years, it's going to be very hard, even if somebody comes out with a competing product, maybe even a better product, it would just be so disruptive to your company to switch um, software providers, right? And so there's some switching costs like that that uh, really help out a business. Once they're established, it's very hard to unseat them. And network effects, I mean, we, we all know kind of the, 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 the uh, classic, uh, Ones like eBay, you know, buyers and sellers, um, you, you've got to have both. And so the more the more buyers you have, the more sellers it attracts. And the more sellers you have, the more buyers are attracted to that marketplace. Um, cost advantages like Walmart, you know, they're just so large. They uh, can get the best pricing from suppliers and then pass those the, that, that good pricing onto its customers, which attracts even more customers and um, they grow even larger and can negotiate even harder with suppliers, right? It's kind of a vicious cycle there. Uh, Costco's probably one of those type of companies. Um, and then there's one called local scale that is not talked about as much, but <clears throat> some businesses um, just in a local or regional area there just may not be uh, room for two players. 
So for kind of a classic example is like a cement, uh, cement factory. I don't know if they're called factories, but cement plant where, um, you know, they they provide all this, the, the concrete and cement needs for maybe a local area. Um, and you can only travel so far with cement before it goes bad. And so, but once you have one for that maybe metro area, um, it would be very, it'd be really stupid for a second person to build another cement plant because they would automatically now be competing with with the existing incumbent and both of them would suffer right because they would just um you know there'd be their price war or they would take up uh the you know they would have to share the demand amongst the two of them so uh there's some businesses where naturally competitors just don't go because it will harm them themselves if they open up a plan or a store or whatever. Any questions there? Wait a minute. This is from the last presentation. Okay. I accidentally left a slide from the last presentation in there. Oh, hey, Steve, just to, that reminds me, I actually went out and bought the uh, Thinking in Bets book. Oh, yeah. Did you, have you had a chance to read it yet? It just came today. Nice, nice. Well, yeah, it's a, it's a good one. Um, yeah, so I think I'll definitely put a uh, maybe a kind of favorite books um, channel up, and then everyone can kind of share their favorite books on the Discord group. So um, let's. So yeah, this is. So I mentioned there's kind of two back of the envelope methods to value a stock quickly that I, I use. Um, so this is kind of the, the first method. So uh, I think Phil Town has a similar thing in his books, um, right? And this is kind of based on earnings per share. If, if earnings per share is a good proxy for um, kind of the free cash flow of the business. So you would, you would take the current earnings per share Right, and you would determine a reasonable growth rate for the next ten years, uh, and so that you're basically trying to calculate what your year ten earnings per share are going to be, and then you are multiplying that year ten earnings per share by what you think would be a good, you know, a reasonable multiple. Um, <clears throat> And then the, this last part is is the part about discounting. So we got to discount back to the present because a dollar in the future is not worth a dollar today. It's going to be worth less. So you've got to have some division factor. And so um, if you divide by four, you're basically discounting by 15% uh, over a 10-year period. So when um, we'll go through an example in just a minute. And if you divide by three, I think you're discounting by about 12%. So that's, that means you're saying um, your required rate of return is either 15% or 12%. That's what you're happy with. Phil Town likes a 15% discount uh, for his stocks. So he's, he's going to be dividing by four. But in my opinion, it's very hard, at least in, in this market, to find many stocks that would be uh, eligible for purchase um, at a 15% discount rate, right? Because I think because lo interest rates are so low that, uh, you know, the market is pricing things, assuming that uh, people will be happy with maybe a 7% return right now. And so, uh, you know, if, if you maybe discount things by 12%, then in my opinion, they're still going to be pretty undervalued. So if you divide by three. So let's let's do uh, an example, and here's a couple here's a couple tables that are, are going to help you. I think primarily we're going to look at this table. <clears throat> so um, does anybody have anybody have a stock that they are looking at or just thinking about? Maybe yeah, we can align align technologies. Align technologies. Okay. A-L-I-G-N. Yeah, let me just pull up 
Are they the ones that make Invisalign? Yep. There it is. All right, so can you see my browser now? Yes. Okay. What's uh, what's Align's ALGN? Okay. So I, there's a f somebody asked me, you know, what's a free website where you can get good data, good numbers? And I like the stockrow.com. Um, kind of stumbled across it a few, couple of years ago. And they've kind of gradually made it better and better. Um, so Align technology, so we can see um, earnings per share down here. Okay, so I like it because it gives you like 10 years of data of, of uh, financials. So 2019 back to 2010. So we look the most recent year, um, 557. These, these are kind of projections for future years, but I would be cautious because sometimes they're, they seem a little bit funky. For example, for a line, they're yeah. saying, it's jumping up to twenty three dollars a share next year, but then going back down. <laughs> so I'm like, I don't know what's up with next year. So don't rely on these numbers for the the projection. Uh, you know, future three years. But the last they're probably assuming everyone sitting at home is going to come and get their braces. <laughs> I don't know, but then it declines. So I think that's just the fat finger number. I don't know. There's some sort of error there. Um. So five fifty seven a share, right? So let me. See if I can just write over my screen with this tool. Uh, so we said 557 per share. If we look at the kind of the growth rate, um, kind of, you know, they've grown their earnings pretty quickly over the last few years, right? Going from a buck 80 to 557. So it's more than. It's more than doubled in the last five years, right? So I don't know. What what do you think would be a reasonable um, growth rate? I think they have some growth rates. No, I thought they had it somewhere on this. So, oh, here we, here we go. Yeah. So there's it has been growing the last five years, about twenty five percent a year their earnings. Over the last three years, about 30%. So <clears throat> over the next 10 years, and, and typically companies, you know, over 10 years, you're going to probably start slowing your growth. Not very many companies grow that fast for a 10-year period. So maybe an average growth rate over 10 years, let's just assume 20%, um, I think, would be still kind of a little bit aggressive. But let's just say it grows 20%, right? Um, let me pull up that table again. So if it's growing 20% a year, then my table is telling me that that's a multiplication factor of 6.2. So what we would do is we would, oops, I need to really figure out how to flip between screens fast. Uh, So thick now. All right, so we're going to multiply this by 6.2, right? So roughly, uh, let's say, I don't know, what is that? Like $35 or something like that? Yeah, 34 and a half. 34 and a half. Let's just round to 35. <laughs> Uh, for simplicity. So we're saying in 10 years, if it does grow 20% a year earnings, it could be uh, spitting off $35 per share, right? And in 10 years from now, maybe what would be a reasonable multiple? Um, for example, if it had the market multiple of anywhere from about 15 to 17, right? That's, that's going to be its P ratio in 10 years, let's say. So we times that by 15. Does anybody have a calculator? Yeah, what's that? So that would be, what would that be? 
525. 525? Yep. Okay. And then we've got to discount it, right? So uh, we discount this back to fair value. Let's let's use three. Um, I think it, it's instead of four, which is a fifteen percent discount rate. Let's use three, which which is about a twelve percent discount rate. So divide this by three is what one seventy five. So I th we're we're saying you know. 175 would be a good value um, using that kind of methodology, right? And the, the stock price, I think, is trading a lot higher than that, right? So the market that's, must that's, be... That's a, that's a, Steve, that's amazing because I'm looking at um, a line in the Rule 1 toolbox. Oh, yeah. And his margin of safety price is $177 a share. So. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> You're good. Maybe it was just a, co a coincidence there, but I, yeah, I don't know. So it kind of in my experience, that's kind of been a good proxy to kind of go through that math of a quick back of the envelope way to uh, determine fair value. So I would say, you know, personally, based on these numbers, that the lines can maybe looks a bit expensive. Now we could look back at some of our assumptions and say, well, were we too conservative or were we, were we you know, way off on any of those? Um, so the market clearly must be, as a, you know, assuming the growth rate of earnings is going to be higher than our assumed 20% over this next 10 year period. So maybe they think that's got a lot more runway to go and you could look further at the company, right? Maybe read, read their annual report, their 10K, their 10Qs, listen to the earnings calls to kind of get a feel of like, how big is this industry? How much runway does it have? Um, is there really no competition that that's going to be coming down the line? Right. I mean, I think you've got the, uh, what's that? You've got that smile direct now, right. Um, that, that went public last year or a few months ago. And um, I, I heard rumors that, you know, uh, a line was kind of, going to suffer because of this new competition, uh, which is maybe why it kind of tanked a few times here. So yeah, with all those factors, me personally, I would say, oh, I, don't, I don't know if the line's that, that good of a price right now, and I'd probably take a pass on it, right? But if it did come down to 175, then I might reconsider um, taking a position in, in that. Okay, well, I know we've, we're kind of already passed the one hour mark. So um, any other questions on this valuation method? Maybe, maybe we stick with this, um, we'll stick with this example for the second kind of quick back of the envelope valuation method, which kind of approaches things from a little bit of a different angle. So the, the second method that I kind of like to use is um, you first find the enterprise value for a company. And I'll show you in a minute what, if, if you're not, if, if you don't know what enterprise value is exactly, I'll show you in just a minute. We'll go back to stockrow.com and I can show you. Um, but it's, it's essentially the value. If you wanted to buy the entire company, like you were Warren Buffett and just had, you know, $130 billion in your coffers. You want to buy the entire company. Enterprise value is what you would need to pay. So it accounts for debt. Right? So you got to buy all the shares, plus you've got to pay off any net debt that the company has. Um, kind of like if you had a house, right? Um, <clears throat> if you're buying my house, uh, you, you have to pay, uh, you have to pay off the, the well you, have, well, you have to basically pay me enough to pay off the mortgage, the debt portion, and then, you know, you got to pay me my equity portion. So uh, you take the enterprise value, divide that by 10. Um, and then you look at the company's 
uh, annual free cash flow over the last few years. And then you ask yourself, is it reasonable, reasonable to believe that the annual free cash flow um, in 10 years, oh, I forgot to put in 10 years, <laughs> should add that edit in there. In 10 years, we'll be at or above this number you got here where you took the enterprise value divided by 10. If the answer is yes, then the stock may be undervalued. If no, then the stock may be overvalued. Um, so let's go back to where we were. All right, so if we look at a line, um, and, and this is one of the reasons why I like this website. So just up front here under capital structure, it'll give you the market cap, and it gives you the enterprise value. Coincidentally, they're pretty close for a line, which means that they must um, not really have any debt. And actually, you can see the typically, probably 90% of the time, enterprise value is going to be more than market cap because companies typically have some debt on their books in excess of their cash. So um, in this case though, their enterprise value is lower than their market cap, which means they probably don't have any debt and have actually now cash in the bank that's, that, that's just sitting there. And so if you bought this company, right, you would just pay the shareholders, you would buy out the shareholders, and you would take control of, of a bank account that maybe has, they're saying it's, it's uh, negative debt, so meaning cash of maybe $736 million in the bank. We can go down and see, yep, they've got, they've got a little bit of debts, um, but they've got $790 million in cash. And so that's why if you were to buy this business, you'd actually pay less than the market cap because you get that cash when you buy the business. So enterprise value about 24 billion, right? And if I divide that by 10, that's 2.4 billion. Let me just write this out. So EV 24 billion, divide that by 10, and that gives me my Of hurdle number. So we ask ourselves in 10 years, right, will free cash flow be more? Forgive my handwriting, it's kind of hard to write on this computer. More than 2.4 billion. If I go down here, uh, there's a line for free cash flow. So you can see in 2019, they had about almost 600 million of free cash flow, which grew a lot from the year before. Um, You see some of the projections. I don't know how accurate these projections are, but three three more years, it looks like it might double again, if these are correct, to over a billion. So you, you ask, you know, in 10 years, will free cash flow be more than 2.4 billion? And uh, right now we know it's 600 million. Right, so it's it's got to basically um, increase by a factor of four in ten years to reach two point four billion. So if we look back at our little table um, back here, we can see 
if it's got to increase by a factor of four, so that's somewhere, it's probably around 15%, right? So it's assuming the, the, the current price is assuming that um, free cash flow grows by about 15% a year for the next 10 years. Did we lose Salim? Hey, Salim, I just admitted you back into the meeting. Thank you. Sorry. I don't know when you dropped, but <laughs> apologize for that. So it, with this method, it actually looks a little bit more reasonable. The, the, the valuation looks, you know, the current price looks more reasonable because the current price in essence uh, is assuming that, um, well, right now we have 600 million in cash flow today. And if we're saying, you know, for it to be a good buy, we want to see 2.4 billion in cash flow in 10 years, that, 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 that assumes we would need about a 15% growth rate in free cash flow a year for the next 10 years, which doesn't seem crazy for a line if it's in this kind of growing industry and uh, if it's the leader in its space, right? So this would tell me, you know, okay, maybe a line is not crazy overvalued, right? My first method said uh, it's very overvalued, but the second method saying, no, it's, it's not maybe crazy overvalued. So uh, I would still probably not make an investment based on these two methods um, and, and this, this analysis. But you can see if you if you do this for a stock and you kind of get the red or the green flag, um, the green light, I guess, for both methods, then you might want to consider making an investment in that stock. Any questions? Okay. So really quickly. Let me just switch to a different screen. Can you all see um, see my Thinkorswim open? Yes. yes. Okay. Do any of you guys use Thinkorswim? Yes. Okay. Um, so one stock that I have been long since kind of um, back here, I kind of got aggressive and were, was buying shares and options was uh, Viacom CBS. So it's uh, informed from the merger of CBS and Viacom, the two media companies. Anyway, um, I wanted to just use this as an example of maybe some technical analysis uh, indicators that I like to look at. So let me zoom in a little bit. So you can see I've got these Bollinger Bands. These red bands are the Bollinger Bands and then this green line is the 20-day simple moving average. Uh, so, so it's the average of the price over the last 20 days. Um, so the Bollinger Bands are one indicator that I like to look at because it it basically is showing you a two standard deviation, uh, two standard deviations above and below the 20 day simple moving average. And so the idea is that when the price like here gets extended above or kind of at that upper Bollinger band line, it's, it's, it's an indicator that the, the stock might be overbought kind of in, that, in the short term, right? And so that there may be some sort of retracement back to the mean because that's kind of a two standard deviation move above the simple moving average. And then likewise, kind of, you know, when it's touching or below the lower Bollinger Band, it might mean that the stock is oversold in the short term. Um, so you can kind of see actually in both of these instances, once it hit the Bollinger Band, the lower Bollinger Band started to go back up. 
kind of reverting to the mean. And then when it hit the above the upper Bollinger Band, it kind of pulled back, right? So it can kind of tell you when a stock is overbought, oversold. I mean, you can even look at a, uh, if you looked at a weekly chart, right? Then you can see how it looks on a weekly chart, right? And we can see that it was looking really oversold back in March. Um, and now it's it's not it's not quite overbought. It's kind of just hanging out there. But it, this is an indicator that works best, kind of at the extremes. It's when you see some sort of extreme, like it's going outside the bands. Um, that that's an indication it's oversold or overbought. Now I like to use it in conjunction with this RSI. RSI uh, is an indicator that also can tell you overbought and oversold conditions. So um, when it's below 30, so for example, here, you can see that it dipped below 30. This, this yellow line is 30. That indicates over, oversold. And so maybe it's going to revert back to the mean, meaning the price may go back up. Uh, and then up here, over 70, if it gets above this line, uh, let me go back to the daily chart. So you see if it gets above this 70 line, this other yellow line, which it did briefly here, which corresponded to this Bollinger Band, going outside the Bollinger Bands, that, that might indicate it's overbought and could pull back, right? So when I'm placing an options trade, you know, if I saw something like this um, and it was here and I was thinking about, you know, maybe I did some fundamental analysis, like this, this stock is cheap, but if I saw this, I might say, eh, maybe I'll wait a few days and see if this price comes back down to get a, a better, get in at a better spot, right? Uh, I don't want to pay up too much for the stock. Um, this might have gone too too far too fast. Um, and then another indicator that I like to look at besides Bollinger Bands and RSI, let me zoom in a little bit. Is this? Um, it's called the TTM squeeze. So you can you can find this if you go to um, you know this studies button here, and then you search TTM. You find this TTM squeeze here, right? I've already added it, um, so you can add it to your chart, and it'll show up below your chart. Ignore the this got the volume here too. So these bars here are the volume. Um, so I'm looking at these red, yellow, blue, and light blue bars along with these dots, right? You can see there's green dots most days, and then there's some red dots um, that come into play every once in a while. And it's those red dots that are the signal that you're looking for. Those red dots indicate that the stock may be in a squeeze situation, which means um, there's been kind of low volatility, buyers and sellers are kind of equally matched. So you can see there's been very little price movement for several days. Um, meaning there's kind of this battle going on between the bulls and the bears in this stock. And they're, they're almost equally matched, so the price is not going anywhere. And the idea is that one of the parties, either the bulls or the bears, are going to win this this war and once they do the stock may pop uh, in one direction or the other and so uh, if, if I see this sometimes it's a good I, I kind of like to put on positions uh, during these squeeze times and generally I would say that it will pop to the overall longer term trend so since March, you can see that it's been in kind of an uptrend. And so my guess is that this squeeze will resolve by popping to the upside. Uh, because what happens is all of the, the uh, bears who are selling the stock short, who are short the position, right? They're trying to drag the price down but if there's enough buying pressure that it starts to pop up, those shorts get squeezed. So they have to cover their shorts 
which means they have to buy back shares. And so they create even more buying pressure to cover their short positions, which pushes up the price, which causes even you know other shorts to uh, also want to cover before it goes up even more. And so there's kind of this cascading effect where the shorts are scrambling to get out the exit door and the exit door might be pretty narrow. And so you can get these pops in price. And it, so if you look at, if you look at a lot of charts, you'll notice kind of a, in an uptrend, you'll notice kind of a recurring um, pattern. Uh, for example, let's, let's bring up Tesla. <laughs> Tesla. Um, you can see, uh, let me zoom out a little bit. But you, you can see that, that stocks will have periods where they just shoot up quickly and then consolidate. So you can see here it shot up, consolidate. I'm not saying anything about the valuation of Tesla. It's just one that uh, I know has gone crazy. This is kind of like an ultimate short squeeze. Um, so you'll, you'll have periods where <clears throat> there's a lot of consolidation. The price doesn't move around much because there's this battle going on. And then eventually um, it pops to the upside. And these moves here are actually huge. It's just looking very small. Um, on this graph because of the drastic move that was made. Uh, but you see how this this squeeze uh, really killed the shorts, right? So you had to cover your position quickly, otherwise you're going from 1,000 to 1,700 in a matter of days. So that's, that's just a little, bit, uh, little short segment on kind of the technical indicators I like to look at. Does anybody have any questions on that? Uh, I'm not even sure where to start. I mean, if this is new to you, I know it's probably a little bit overwhelming. The only um, question I have is that the see it's supporting the the top of the Bollinger Band, but it's it's even on your other other one that you were look, looking at. Yeah, let's go back to that one. Um, so you're saying that you that it would probably pop to the the, the upside. The way the, yeah, the way the momentum is going, right? But even right. though, would you say that even though it's near the top of the Bollinger Band, it would still do that? Yeah. So I mean, ideally, you would have gotten in. I mean, a, a an ideal time to get in is so it's in the red here on this TTM squeeze, right? And it's maybe um, towards the low or middle of the Bollinger Band, that's probably ideally when you would have entered into a position here. Assuming that you know you looked at the fundamentals, you like that as well, you think it's an uh, undervalued stock, it's got a good trend, um, and so you're now looking kind of at the very short term, and you're saying, all right, it's, it's hitting the lower Bollinger Band, right? Um, so, so maybe it's a good time to enter because it could start popping up and maybe we're just going to pop out of the squeeze and it could keep running for a little while. Right now, you know, the last couple days, it did hit that upper Bollinger Band. So that could be, uh, you know, maybe it's a, it's going to kind of drift down a little bit uh, over the next few days, but it, it could start to enter into this consolidation, this red dot phase again. Um, so you just never know exactly when it's going to pop, but usually it results, it, it resolves in a, a pop either to the upside or to the downside. So if you did your fundamental homework, you know, that also can help you guess, guess whether it's going to resolve to the upside or the downside, right? If you're like, this is an extremely undervalued stock, you know, like, I don't know if it's going to go down uh, even further. I mean, I would, you know, maybe you're, you're, you're uh, making an educated guess that, you know, I think this is actually going to resolve to the upside and start to trend back towards fair value. Any other questions? Okay, so um, 
with that, just really quickly, and maybe we'll cover this more in our next session because I know we don't have a lot of time. I scheduled this for an hour and a half and um, just to not make the, the videos extremely long for those who are watching the recording. Let me go back to the, the PowerPoint. So I, I said I wanted to just briefly cover three option strategies. The first one I don't think we have to take much time to cover, uh, especially since you guys are all on the Phil Town course, but um, <clears throat> plain vanilla calls are actually, you know, still one of just my favorite strategies. They're, they're very simple. Um, it's not fancy at all, right? You are just buying uh, a right to buy the stock. You're, you're buying a contract that gives you the right to buy the stock at a certain price uh, before a certain date, right? And so you want the stock to move up above your strike price. Uh, you, you actually want it to move above your strike price plus whatever premium you paid for it. Uh, so in this example here, I know you guys probably know this, but for, for those on the recording, uh, this looks like they were buying the $40 strike. And let's say this is probably like the $44 mark, which means if that's where you break even, that means they probably paid a $4 premium. And so really you have to, so you gotta add those. So your break even, break even price is at $44. Now the, some of the, the nice features about just buying a straight up call is that you have a kind of massive leverage on your funds, right? So um, you effectively, by owning this call option, uh, you have exposure to the upside of, you have 100 share exposure to the upside above your strike price plus your premium you paid. And so basically for every dollar that the stock goes above your um, <clears throat> strike price plus, plus premium, you'll make $100. And so maybe you only paid a few hundred dollars, you know, I would bet for this option, let's say it was a six month option, you might pay, um, if, the, if, the price, if the stock was trading at $40, you'd probably pay $400, right? You pay $400 and um, you have massive upside. If the stock goes up $10, $20, um, you can easily get two, three, 400 times your return on, on capital. So you want to use long calls when you're pretty confident about the direction of the stock and you are... Um, Pretty, yeah, you're pretty bullish, um, pretty confident about the direction. You're pretty confident about the limited downside. That's that's when I like to use just straight up call options. Any questions there? So on the, on the Steve, are you doing this only when you want to own the stock? No. So that that's. Um, Yeah, so so you get the you have the right to buy the stock at the stock the strike price, right? So you could um, exercise your call and actually take delivery of the shares if you wanted to, right? I guess if you if you wanted to own it, but what I typically do is I just I still get the the same kind of profits as if I own the shares. Um, if the stock if the stock goes up, my option value will go up, and I'll still reap the rewards of whatever profit I would have had had I owned the shares. But I typically will sell these before expiration, so I'm not I'm not holding straight up calls all the way to expiration. So and and the reason for that as well is. When you, you're going to pay, so you pay a premium, right, to buy a call option. 
and um, you're you're essentially paying some time value. So the longer duration, um, the the call. So if you have a long time before expiration, you're going to pay more than if you have just a few days until expiration. Um, so that's called time value. So embedded in, I guess, if you look at, let's say you have this. Um, just draw it out. This four dollar premium. Part of this is going to be time value that you're paying. And well, if you buy an out of the money call option, all of it's time value because there's no intrinsic value. Uh, but for this purpose, let's just say the stock was trading at like $41 and we bought the $40 option, then there'd be like intrinsic value be $1 and this time value, let's say is uh, $3. So intrinsic value I'm saying is $1 because um, if you have the right to buy the stock at 40 and it's trading at 41, then if you exercise that option today, right? You said, hey, I want to um, buy 100 shares at $40 uh, today from, from the market, then you could do that and immediately turn around and sell it for $41 and collect $100 in profit, right? So right now your option really should at least be worth $1. So that's what we call kind of intrinsic value of the option. But you're paying more than that because maybe there's still five, six months left before expiration. And so the stock could move higher. So you have to pay the seller of that option um, above and beyond what the intrinsic value is because it could run over the next five months upward and they want to be compensated for that risk that it could go up. So, but the problem is if you hold these till expiration, the closer you get to expiration, especially in the last 30 days before expiration, um, <clears throat> if you, you, you'll, you, you have time value always until it gets close to expiration. So close to expiration, your time value starts to like, whittle down. And so, for example, let's say the stock stayed at $41 and we're starting to approach expiration. Even if we held that same price at 41, all this time value would start to erode and your, your option might just end up being worth $1 and you paid $4 for it, even though the stock price didn't move, let's say that entire time. So I don't, I don't hold options. I usually don't like them to um, have less than, if I'm doing a straight call, I don't like them to have less than three months uh, uh, left uh, on their life. I will sell them or roll them to a longer dated. So you can keep, you can keep going, right? You can roll them and you can sell that one and buy another longer dated one. You'll just have to typically pay out more money to do that, to keep on that trade. So once I get kind of the move that I've been anticipating, I will typically sell them um, completely or I will roll them, but take off some of my exposure. So I will maybe roll them out to a higher call or a higher strike and pay less of a premium and still collect like a net credit. And we can go over that more in future sessions, but calls can be powerful. Uh, they have an inherent like built-in um, uh, kind of a risk or stop loss feature where the, the more that the stock actually goes down, the less you lose. So for every dollar the stock goes down, you start losing less and less. 
which is nice, right? That's what you'd want. If, if the stock is going to go against you, you want to be losing less and less every dollar it ticks down. Uh, and opposite of that, which is a nice plus, is as the stock ticks up, you, your, your option gains in value faster and faster. So going from, in this example, $41, $41 to $42, you'll, your option value will increase at a certain rate. Going from $42 to $43, your option will increase in value at an even faster rate. And then from 43 to 44, you'll increase at an even faster rate. So, so that's a nice feature. Anything else? So if you paid four dollars for that call option, how much would you make off of it when you sell it? If you sold it at let's say uh, whatever you what whatever you would normally sell it for? Yeah. So it, it just depends. Um, if you kind of want a, a quick uh, estimate of kind of how the value of your option will change. Uh, if you buy an at the money, so let's say the stock is trading at $40 and you buy a $40 call option. So that's at the money, right? You're buying an equivalent strike price to the, the current market price. That will have a delta of 50. So we kind of talked about delta a little bit in the last session. But a delta of 50 means um, that for every $1 increase, so if it goes from 40 to $41, the, stock, the underlying stock price, your option will increase by $50. So let's say we bought it for, you know, we bought it for 400, right? It goes up a dollar, then it, it should be worth about 450. But your delta is a dynamic number, so it actually your delta all your delta increases as the stock price increases. So once it's at forty one, um, you might have this might have a delta of fifty two, or something like that, right? So if it goes from forty one to forty two dollars, then you might increase by fifty two dollars. So now it's like worth five hundred and two dollars, right? So that's what I was saying about the the rate of increase increases as the underlying stock price increases. So um, typically, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't look at it and say, "Oh, I made X dollars, and so now I'm going to sell." I'll look at the underlying price, and maybe I determine fair value for me in my estimations fifty. So if, if it gets to fifty, then um, I'll probably sell. Right, and then it's just whatever profits have racked up by that time, which is going to be affected by how much time has passed since you bought it, right? Because you've got that ongoing time decay that I talked about. It's kind of going against you, but then the, the stock's appreciated, right? Um, if we just assume a delta of 50 for this whole $10 move, it's actually gonna be more uh, because it increases, right? But if we just assume 50, 50 times 10, that, that should mean I should have at least a $500 profit um, by the time it gets to 50, which is more than a double based on the numbers that I just gave, right? So $500 profit or your option would probably be worth about $900 or something like that. Thanks. Any other questions? In the future, will you cover um, when to use a when to sell versus when to buy an option? And in, in rule one, Phil basically just teaches selling options for the premium. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I um, personally lean more toward buying options, um, but I think there's. You know, Phil Town's strategy is not a bad one. 
like selling those puts and trying to, I, I mean, his, his strategy is more about acquiring ownership of stock and reducing your cost basis for the stock. Yeah. Right. Yeah. My strategy, I guess, is more about, um, especially if you have a smaller account to start with, because Phil's strategy assumes you have lots of money to acquire the shares at those if, if they get put to you, right? Um, so that you have the funds there to, to buy the shares and that you have the funds to be able to sell puts because if to sell puts, you usually have to have the cash collateral in your account. Your broker will require that and it usually takes a lot, um, right? Even selling a, a $10 put on a $10 stock, you're gonna need $1,000 uh, held in, in your brokerage account to do that. Uh, if it's a hundred dollar stock, you're going to need ten thousand dollars just held in your your account for that one trade, right? Whereas buying options, you actually need very little money, um, and then you can reap reap pretty big rewards if it moves in your favor. If so, to, uh, he, he, yeah, the bull put spreads and iron condors and things like that. He's he's doing to generate cash flow, but you know he, he's definitely doing. Uh, Puts and calls if you're you know, wanting to buy or sell the stock, but he he's real big about not doing any kind of naked you know put or call unless you want to buy or sell the the stock. Um, but then he'll do the other stuff for cash flow generation in order to start building up a nest egg. Right. Okay. Yeah, and you guys would know much better than I would about what, what he's doing exactly. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, it sounds like like a good strategy. I mean, I was just reading some some stuff the other day on put selling, and um, you know, I I do think that selling puts that strategy, you you actually can adjust it most of the time so that you don't take a loss. So I, th I think there's ways to do it where you really reduce the likelihood of ever taking a loss. Right, and then at the end of the day, if you want to, um, uh, if you don't want to keep rolling it or adjusting it, then you can just take delivery of the shares at your strike price, and you own those shares. So, um, it, you know, I, I think I personally am looking to do more of that um, because I, th I do think it is a pretty sound strategy. But um, for kind of purposes of this course and you know, building up a, maybe a smaller account quickly. Um, these are probably my three favorite strategies that I'm presenting here. So we did talk about this one with vertical debit call spreads last time. And um, so I won't go over it in, in a lot of detail, but I don't know, do we have still have Arlene? Is Arlene there still? I am. Okay. So I don't know if you are familiar with this strategy, but you're basically buying a call uh, and then selling a higher priced call against it. So in this example, you can see the graph here. We're buying this $40 call And then we are selling this um, $45 call. So we have the right to buy the stock at 40. We sold the right to somebody else to buy the stock from us for 45. And so that's why you can see on this graph, our max profit, we can't, we can't make any more money beyond $45 because we've sold off that upside essentially. Right. And so where we profit is um, kind of between 40 and 45, well, specifically between 42 and 45. So this is telling me since the break even is at 42, for this spread, you know, buying the 40, selling the 45, we're paying a net debit of, of $2 per, 
per share for that option. So what we have to, just like with the call, we would take this, the, the, the long call strike price, which is 40, right? Add the $2 premium we're paying. So our break even is $42. Oops, break even. So to make money, the stock has to be trading at or above $42 at expiration for us to be in this kind of uh, this profit zone here, right? And max profit is at 45 right here. So what you're essentially doing is, so let's, let's go back to the same numbers I used in the last example. Um, so that 40 call, you know, I'm putting notes all over the place. We pay $4 for that one, right? And then, so that's a positive $4 that we, or sorry, no, we paid $4. That's a negative $4 that go $4 out the door. But then we sold the 45 call and that, let's say we, we sold that for $2. So we get a positive $2. So net, right, negative four, positive two, we have a negative $2. So that's our net premium that we paid, which is what I put here, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's why we have to get over this uh, paid $2. So we have to actually have the stock over 42 to, to get a profit. So uh, the, we, we did talk about, and you can, you can watch the last session. We talked about why I like these vertical debit spreads, um, but essentially you don't have to have the price move up much to get a double in your um, uh, underlying or on your capital. So you spend $2 here. If it's, if it's at 45 at expiration, this position should be worth five, which is the difference between the two strike prices, the 45 and the 40. So it should be worth five. That's your max profit. If it's anything above 45, you paid two. Right, so your profit would be three, which would yeah, three hundred bucks off of a two hundred dollar investment. So this example would be more than a hundred, more than a double. And uh, you you know, let's say you did this when the stock price was trading at forty one, right? So the stock only had to go up four dollars, about ten percent, and you make an over hundred percent return. Okay. Yeah. I assume like when you use this kind of trade, if you know, uh, I don't know if floor is the right term, but if you know mm -hmm. there, that there's a resistance level at a certain price, then you know, you you have more of a likelihood of having success with your trade. Yeah, you? yeah, exactly. So that's that technical analysis part, right? So if you can see, um, you know, let's go back to, let me delete this. Um, this chart, Oops. you know, you could see kind of a, you can kind of see a short term floor, right? Right around, uh, I'm not good at drawing things on here, but yeah, you can see right around this $22 mark, you know, right. it, 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 it kind of is not dipping below that the several times it's tested it. It just kind of bounces off of it. And so kind of back to here, right? When it hit down this 22, that would probably have been a good place to enter a trade because we've got the, we've got the support there. We can look at the last few weeks. Um, it's never gone below. And then it's at the bottom of the Bollinger Bands. It's in this squeeze, this red dot period here on those indicators, right? Mm -hmm. And then lastly, let's say we did our analysis and we're, we say that this stock is undervalued. Then you've got kind of those four green lights. 
to say, all right, let's maybe put on a position here. And um, you can either do a straight up call if you're extremely bullish, which is going to cost you more, or you can do one of these vertical debit call spreads where you're buying a call, but then you're helping to finance the cost of that by selling a higher call, right? right. <clears throat> so maybe you would say, I'll buy this, uh, uh, I'll buy a 21 call or something like that. And I'll simultaneously sell a 28 because you can see maybe there'll be some resistance up here. So um, maybe I wouldn't profit that much from it, from this move above 28 anyway. So why not just sell it for some premium, create a vertical debit spread, and then, you know, small move, I'll probably be able to double my, my money. Okay. Yeah, that's really neat how to, to see how the graphs kind of come into play when you're trying to figure out. Yeah, like I was, uh, I was a very bit, like I resisted technical analysis early on when I first started investing. I was like, this is voodoo, right? Like charts and stuff. And, um, but, it, you know, it, it, it does actually have some logical basis in it. Um, there's just certain price levels where uh, people are willing to buy it and there's price well levels where a lot of people are willing to sell it right and those naturally create these support and resistance levels so you might as well take advantage because the option pricing formula is not considering whether you're near a floor or a ceiling it's just it's pricing things the same regardless of where you are on the chart right so you you want to kind of um note that and tilt odds in your favor and buy when you're or when you're by a floor of support and sell maybe when you're at a ceiling of resistance that's the that's the whole idea there um <clears throat> and lastly i know we're going super far over this is going to be end up being a two-hour video again um i guess i'll just have to start like cutting down my powerpoints <laughs> like and uh breaking this up over a couple different sessions so we can get into this more but if you want to get a little bit more fancy, in short, kind of the two minute version of a diagonal calendar spread is um, it's the same as kind of same concept as a as the last one, the vertical debit spread. But you are instead of selling the same expiration uh, month call, right? So maybe you did like um, October in October, right? You did an October 40 and an October 45. You would maybe do like an October 40 call. You'd purchase that and then sell an August 45. So you're selling one that is going to expire sooner. And the reason you might do that is because um, of that time decay, right? You just want that one to expire worthless and um, decay really rapidly. So you, you collect a credit um, when you sell it and you just want it to become worthless really fast to help finance your long call, your $40 call. And so sometimes these, these can work out nicely. Um, it helps to protect your downside. Uh, you, you kind of are hoping that you don't get above maybe that $45 level in the short term and then that expires worthless, that $45 call. And then after that, maybe you're hoping the stock rips up. Uh, so it helps to finance your call purchase. Uh, you just have to wait maybe a, a few weeks to a month or so. So we can go, we can go over that one more in future um, sessions, but it, that one could be a powerful strategy as well. Any questions? I appreciate you doing all this and investing your time. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate you guys participating. You know, hopefully we can get a, a good routine going. And part of this is to figure out what people want to learn. And um, then hopefully we can roll out kind of the, the course to the masses right, right when we, when we nail down everything. So appreciate your feedback. Uh, if there are things that you want to learn about or talk about, in these sessions, then feel free on that Discord group to let me know, uh, and then we'll try and work that in. Uh, and and you know we're we're just trying to 
produce the best course possible for you guys and the, the end goal is to help people grow their wealth faster right and uh, trying to mitigate risk so uh, hopefully we can do that for you but uh, feel free to reach out if you have questions or comments or feedback we'll take it all right anything yep. else before we no, just my final comment. No, great session. I, what I'm realizing now is following Phil Town's approach is an advantage and a curse. I'm used to seeing everything from the side of the seller. Yeah. Um, and so whenever we, we start talking about buying, I have to wait a second. Uh, wh what am I doing here? Um, so I think, you know, with time, I think I'll probably get more accustomed to thinking about the, both sides of the coin, so to speak. Yeah, yeah no, it's... Sure. It's kind of, yeah, it's hard to kind of twist things around and think the opposite in your mind. So um, since I do mostly buying, right, yeah, it, it's harder for me to think about the sell side. <laughs> so I, I feel your pain. But we'll get there. All right. Well, um, if there's nothing else, then I will post this recording uh, for the rest of the group in the next couple days. And, um, you know, we'll probably have another session in a few weeks here. We probably, seems like we do um, kind of one, one every, every two to three weeks. So um, you can look forward to that. Great. Again, thanks so much. Yeah, no problem. All right. Thanks for your participation. Enjoy the rest of your evening. You too. Talk next time. All right. See ya. Bye-bye.